as well. Uh, thank you for pressing record. Uh, and then just to say, Katrin will be facilitating this. Uh, Katrin, do you want to kick it off? Thank you, Dani. That's very kind. Welcome, everybody. Um, we'll have an overview over the session with um, the director of the Humanitarian Office of UNFPA, Shoko, who will introduce. And then the presentation of um, Dani and um, Eric Dupont. Um, and, and some other of the colleagues will have a quick Q&I session afterwards. So I'd kindly ask you to put any questions that occur to you um, during the presentation into the chat box. Please make sure that the chat is configured to reach everybody, so all participants. Um, and we will, as part of the Q&A session, go through those questions and address them and leave room for new ones. And without further ado, We'll open the session and I'm handing over to um, the director of the humanitarian office, Shoko. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, you know, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, distinguished colleagues and partners. As I was introduced, I'm Shoko Arakaki. Uh, I am Director of Humanitarian Office of UNFPA, United Nations uh, Population Fund. So thank you also for joining today's webinar on the sixth edition of Interagency Emergency Reproductive Health Kits. UNFPA, we often say, no supplies, no program. This mantra is even more true in humanitarian and fragile settings. Together with our IWAG partners, UNFPA continuously works to ensure not only the supply are in place to meet life-saving SRH needs, but to ensure supplies are in right quality. IARH kits are an essential component of SRH service delivery in humanitarian operations. In a coordinated humanitarian response, UNFPA plays a critical role as an interagency provider of the kit on behalf of national and international partners. As many of you are aware, UNFPA has been working with IWAG partners to devise the IARH kits for the last few years. This Revision of the kits is the one of the most significant since their creation. Not only the kits content has been updated, the structure and certain logistics requirement has been modified to improve ordering and management, as well as improve the con contextualization of supplies to needs of particular settings. We are confident that this review of the kits will address many of clinical and logistics bottlenecks being experienced by partners to the last mile in humanitarian operations. We are also finalizing the first UNFPA humanitarian supply strategy. The first five-year strategy aims to ensure that right supplies arrive where they are needed most. With the speed, and the quality required in humanitarian operations. The strategy provides a foundation for systematic improvement to UNFPA's humanitarian supply chain and logistics network, addressing many of the systematic challenges being experienced by partners who are rely on UNFPA for supplies in humanitarian operations. The strategy also prioritizes enhanced interagency coordination and the partnership with IWARG and other humanitarian and the development health partners to improve speed, availability, and quality of SRH supplies to the last mile across the humanitarian development nexus. This is also fundamental preconditions for UNFPA and then all of our IWARG partners that rely on us to ensure the life-saving MIPS services are in place in crisis. I would like to invite all of our IWAG partners, particularly the user of the kids in the field, to continuously provide us UNFPA with your feedback and guide us UNFPA on how we can better support you to deliver SRH supplies. 
Thank you again for your our great partnerships and then very much looking forward to our continued work for saving lives and protecting rights and dignity of women and girls in a humanitarian setting. Now over to Eric. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Shoko. And uh, likewise, dear partner, it's, it's a pleasure for me to, to say a few words. And I'm not going to repeat what Shoko said. She made some very important point here. But uh, this, the, the IH kits are really a key product for us to our humanitarian response. And uh, in the past year, we have seen a major increase of, um, you know, of our hum humanitarian interventions. And this has translated into a, a major increase of our procurement spend. Four years ago, what we spent on, on kits was about $6 million. Last year, we spent $13 million. So the spend are more than doubled in only four years. And this product is not only core to our response at UNFPA, but it's also very strategic because it goes beyond UNFPA. And partners like you are interested and need these kits. And it's important that we are equipped to, to respond to your, to your request and need for, for these kits. And the interagency working groups on reproductive health in crisis has actually mandated UNFPA to be the lead agency to supply these kits to partners. Uh, so in supplying these kits, we have been facing over the years a number of challenges. Challenges We need to combine speed, and at the same time, we need to ensure the quality of the product. We cannot make shortcuts on quality, so we need to, to be able to have these two combined. And, um, and, and it seems simple uh, that, you know, it should be easy to find suppliers to supply these kits, but actually we have really struggled in, in, in many years to identify a sufficient, I would say, supply base enough suppliers who can supply these kits to our uh, satisfaction. And the good thing is that now we have three long-term agreements with suppliers. In the past, we were only dealing with one supplier, but now we have three long-term agreements in place. We have been able to preposition these kits in Europe, in Asia, and soon we will have them in, um, in the Middle East. So, so, and this is really a, a great achievement for us. And uh, really we see these kits as not only serving our, our own programmatic needs, but also the, the needs of our, of our partners. And, and one of the challenges we often see with the kits as well in the supply chain management is the shipment. While we have the kits in stock, it's difficult to ship to countries like Yemen or Sudan, or now we have a major bottleneck in, in Cameroon. So we have also established in UNFPA, a dedicated emergency procurement unit dealing with logistics and freight as well. So uh, with time, we are better and better equipped to respond fast to the needs of UNFPA and of our partners with, with kids. So thank you very much for, for listening to me. And, uh, and that was it. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. And I'll hand over directly to Dani to start the presentation. Danielle. Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Danny German. I'm the UNFPA Humanitarian Supplies Analyst. Um, and I will start to go through the presentation and some colleagues of mine from the Procurement Services Branch at UNFPA will also uh, contribute and introduce themselves as they uh, so start. So just to quickly look at what we will go through in the presentation. So I know many of you are very familiar with the MISP uh, part of the the IWAG's core uh, contribution to humanitarian response. However, we'll go quickly through the kits and the MISP. Uh, we'll also look at an overview of the revision process. Um, then we'll look quickly at the revised content, including changes to the actual clinical content um, and changes to logistics and packaging requirements. Um, then we'll look at the new tools and documents that have been developed both for within the kits and as support to the kits. Uh, then we'll quickly look at the ordering process for third party uh, procurement, uh, look at how you guys can provide feedback regularly on the kits and just a quick reminder around some logistic basics to take into consideration when procuring the kits. So before we look at the kits, as I said, it's important to remember what is an acute emergency and what are the priority interventions for SRH in this period that we will need supplies for. Many of you will be familiar with these first few slides, but we feel that they're important to remember for the purpose of the kits. The diagram on the right is one iteration of the emergency program cycle. The cycle has many names and many different ways to visualize it, but the overall messages are the same. 
Before an emergency strikes, you're in what is understood to be the preparedness phase where there's relative stability and where interventions are undertaken to mitigate the impact of a potential crisis. The immediate period of time after an emergency strikes is considered an acute response. This period of time, which often lasts between three to six months but can continue much longer, is the most chaotic period with the highest risk of loss of life. The post-acute phase is categorized by relative stabilization of the crisis this period can be relatively short or can last for years. This is the period where it is possible to have a greater awareness of the actual needs and where it is essential to expand upon the services available to the affected population. So how do we determine the services that are most essential to provide in an acute emergency response? The interagency community through the IWAG has come together to define the MISP or the Minimum Initial Service Package. The MISP is a set of, a set of minimum life-saving SRH interventions that must be in place immediately after the onset of an acute emergency. And the MISP activities constitute the core of SRH services are non-optional and non-negotiable. However, as we often will say, minimum does not mean only, and if a context that is going through an emergency has the capacity to do more, then more should be done. So as a reminder, what is included in the MISP? The MISP has six objectives, including two coordination objectives highlighted in blue and four service objectives in black. The four service objectives include preventing sexual violence, responding and responding to the needs of survivors, preventing the transmission of and reducing morbidity and mortality to HIV and STIs, preventing excess maternal and newborn morbidity and mortality and preventing unintended pregnancies. There is also a note at the end which reads that it is important to ensure that safe abortion care is available to the full extent of the national law. So during crisis, the collapse of health systems, including interrupted medical supply chains, the destruction of health facility infrastructure, death or displacement of healthcare personnel, and a lack of access to functioning health facilities is common. The availability of essential drugs, basic equipment, and other supplies needed to implement the MISP is crucial to being able to properly ensure that the MISP services are in place from the very onset of a crisis. Being able to ensure the availabilities of these commodities in a timely manner comes with a number of significant logistical barriers. These include damaged ports of entry, embargoes, killed or displaced health personnel, destroyed health facilities, huge migratory populations with different and unknown often demographics, unreliable access to health facilities um, due to things like security or infrastructure destruction. One way to address these barriers is through the provision of prepackaged kits that include all of the medicines, devices, and commodities necessary to provide the MISP. The IRH kits are a set of prepackaged emergency health kits that include all of the medicines, devices, and commodities necessary to provide this MISP. UNFPA has been managing the kits on behalf of the IWAG since their creation in the 1990s and updating them every few years to ensure compliance with the latest evidence and shall solve logistics barriers. The kits are designed for an acute phase of an emergency and should be ordered within the first hours of a response in settings where normal supply chains have broken down and or the capacity of the health of the supply chain to manage the influx of supplies required in a timely manner is insufficient. The kits are not intended as resupply kits and if used as such may result in the accumulation of items and medicines which are not needed. It must be emphasized that although supplying medicines and medical devices in standard prepackaged kits is convenient early in an emergency, specific local needs must be assessed as soon as possible and further supplies must be ordered accordingly. Once basic reproductive health services have been established, the reproductive health coordinator should assess reproductive health needs and attempt to reorder bulk medicines, devices, and equipment based on consumption of these items in order to ensure that the reproductive health program can be sustained. Recognizing that bulk item procurement may not be possible in all settings after three months, there are still ways to make a more informed reorder of the kits until the acute response has passed and there is a potential to stabilize the medical supply chain. 
To support this, all efforts should be made to strengthen or develop medical supplies logistics management information systems in coordination with UNFPA, WHO, UNICEF, and other health partners. The sixth edition of the kits, which are being launched today, went through a formal review process both within UNFPA and with IWAG and humanitarian health partners. As a foundation of the review, research was done on the content and use of the RH kits with UNFPA, country, regional, and headquarters perspectives, as well as interagency input. Based on this outcome, a review of the WHO guidelines and a review of new or updated products, as well as considerations of the revised MISP, a technical review paper was then developed. After this, an interagency technical reference group then made final recommendations for the revised content. I'll now pass over to Natalia from our procurement services branch. Thank you. Um, yeah, so hello. Um, my name is Natalia Gertz-Benz and I work as a contracts associate and the SPC or strategic procurement cluster of UNFPA. Um, I will touch upon the contractual side of the IRH kits, ensuring that our kits are in line with the requirements and that the long-term agreements are fulfilling uh, uh, the suppliers um, um, uh, which we have under long-term agreements are fulfilling their contractual obligations. So this particular slide demonstrates um, the complexity of the solicitation process undertaken by the team. Um, the bit targeting uh, the previous fifth edition of the kits was published in December 2017, and it took us uh, an additional limited tender published in October 2018 and more than two years to establish the LTA's long-term agreement for the kits. The quality of our products um, uh, is crucial and UNFPA must ensure that the quality of our suppliers um, uh, is guaranteed. So for some of the items, the videos had to present more than 30 different uh, supporting technical documents per item. For some of the items, we had to conduct nine rounds of clarifications or additional bidding exercises allowing us to achieve the technical product compliance. So imagine that our teams had to review and approve the documentation in total for 462 kit components multiplied by the number of the bidders. So we are speaking about more than 50,000 different documents. Um, so it's a lot of documentation to process. Nevertheless, we achieved a favorable scenario of having more than one kit supplier. And as Eric Dupont mentioned, currently we have three kit suppliers assembling um, uh, the IRH kits. It gives us leverage, uh, ability to improve delivery times and uh, use the synergies uh, to solve any potential bottlenecks. So as soon as the LTAs uh, were signed, um, uh, our team immediately initiated the preparations for the new sixth edition of the kits, publishing the bit in December 2019. And even only 43 kit components had to be solicited. It took us one year to sign the first LTA. The COVID-19 pandemic hindered uh, the bidders to collect the sufficient technical documentation from the manufacturing sources, making the technical assessment in some cases impossible. Nevertheless, the good news is that the first two LTAs are now signed, while the last one will be signed off in the coming weeks. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, finding the information on the IRH kits, you are welcome to visit or revisit UNFPA product catalog and search either by the specific kit name or follow the left panel categorizing the content of our catalog. 
the new edition of the kits is now divided in core kits and complementary commodities. The description of the kits, starting with the abbreviation CC, is the indication of a complementary commodity. More additional information will be shared by Daniele in the following slides. Um, next slide, please. Um, we know um, that securing timely assembly of the kits is of paramount importance in acute emergencies. Therefore, apart from establishing LTA's long-term agreements with three different kit suppliers, several initiatives have been implemented by the team. For instance, UNFPA mapped out the usual suspects of product bottlenecks for which we established at least two different manufacturing sources, the primary and the secondary one, allowing us to make a shift if needed. As some of the kit components are contraceptive products, we are sourcing these items based on already established UNFPA long-term agreements and through the trilateral agreements, which are signed between three parties, UNFPA, kit supplier, and contraceptive supplier of UNFPA. We aim to have at least two LTA sources for each contraceptive component of the kit, allowing us to shift to a different source without delaying the assembly of the kits. And even the resources as cars, the assessment of the kit components is always a priority number one with UNFPA. In case of any changes, the review and implementation of the changes always receives the adequate attention across all UNFPA teams. Thank you. Thanks, Natalia. So when looking at the major changes to the kit content, we will first look at the clinical updates. These slides do not indicate all of the changes, but represent the ones of most clinical significance. Quickly looking at these updates, we can see that in kit 2A, we have up included an umbilical cord scissor instead of a razor. In kit 3, we have updated the PEP guidance as per WHO recommendations. In kit 6A, we have added basic neonatal supplies like a sling, scale, and stopwatch. And in 6B, we have updated the maternal infection drugs, including misoprostol for PPH, and have now added basic neonatal antibiotics and vitamin K. In kit 7, we have updated the antibiotics for transcervical procedures. In kit 8, we have updated the antibiotics and removed the outdated metal curatets and uterine sound. We have also replaced oxytocin with misoprostol for post-abortion hemorrhage. In kit 10, we have updated the vacuum and added a posterior cup. And in 11A, we have updated the abdominal surgery equipment list to conform to WHO guidelines. In kit 11B, we have made the same modifications to maternal and neonatal antibiotics as 6B. We've also added a series of items, including significantly transexamic acid, atropine, and epinephrine. Epi yeah. We've also replaced lidocaine with bevacaine hydrochloride and updated the supplies for sepsis. Finally, in kit 12, we have added more sizes of blood bags and included reusable blood gripping tiles. In addition to clinical changes, we've made modifications to the structure of the kits, which we are confident will improve ordering and management, as well as improve the contextualization of supplies to the needs of a particular setting. One major factor which contributed to orders which were not always reflective of the needs was the categorization of kits into blocks. We often saw partners on the ground procuring all of the kits in one block as it was perceived as being a set. There's also a major addition of a new group of kits referred to as complementary commodities, which we'll go into detail in a few minutes. We have removed drugs specific to malaria treatment of pregnant women with guidance given on the procurement of the interagency emergency health kit malaria modules. 
And we have updated all of the information, education, communication materials, and including nearly all of them in English, French, Arabic, and Spanish. We've also removed full manuals like the family planning manual or others, which would just pile up in closets around the world. We've also replaced these manuals with key information notes and we'll work with the IWAG on the development of a document repository located on the IWAG website for clinical logistics and IEC resources of the kits. Finally, there are modifications to packaging and labeling. On this slide, we can see the revised RH kits sixth edition. As was the case with the fifth, fifth edition kits, each are designed for specific levels of a health system and for specific population sizes for a period of three months. We will look in a minute at all three categories of kits. What is important to mention is that with the sixth edition kits, the kits in blue text on this infographic have been moved to be designated as complementary commodities. On this slide, you can see the new complementary commodities. The complementary commodities are supplies that will be ordered in specific circumstances and require basic pre-crisis data. Each item has its own series of basic conditions that will need to be fulfilled prior to procurement. Overall, these supplies should be ordered only if providers or the population were trained to use the commodity prior to the emergency, if commodities were known and used prior to the emergency, in protracted or post-acute emergency settings, and where the use of supplies is allowed within the national law. The complementary commodities are designed to provide a method for country offices and partners to contextualize supplies more to the setting that you are operating in through the procurement of specific items not needed by all operations. For example, in malaria prone settings, procurement of the IHK malaria modules or in places where facility delivery is high, you can procure extra oxytocin. In the kit manual and the revised kit calculator, colleagues in the field are given guidance on how to quantify the needs for these kits. I will also note that while we reference the newborn kits, which will be managed by UNICEF, they are not yet available. We will now quickly look at the kits which are in each category. The kits at this level of care are meant to be used by service providers delivering SRH services at the community health care level. Each kit is designed to provide for the needs of 10,000 people over a three month period. These include male condoms, clean delivery kits, post rape kits, oral and injectable contraceptive kits, and supplies for the treatment of STIs. Essentially, kits at this level can be done in a lower level care facility by nurses or midwives, as they do not require high technical skills. The kits at this level are meant to be used by service providers delivering SRH care at the BMONC level of care. They, can, they contain both uh, disposable and reusable materials for use by trained healthcare providers with midwifery and selected, selected obstetric and neonatal skills at the health center or hospital level. These kits are designed to be used by a population of 30,000 people over three months. And they include the clinical uh, delivery assistance kits, both reusable and disposable supplies, supplies for the management of complications of miscarriage and abortion, repair of cervical and vaginal tears, as well as assisted delivery with vacuum extraction. Essentially, kits at this level can be done in a health center without surgical capacity by midwives in particular. Finally, the kits at this level are meant to be used by service providers delivering care at the CMONC level. They contain both disposable and reusable supplies as well to provide comprehensive emergency obstetric and newborn care at the referral or surgical obstetric level. These include obstetric surgery and severe obstetric complications kits, both again, the disposable and reusable supplies, as well as the blood transfusion kit. And these kits are meant to cover a population of approximately 150,000 people for a three month period. Essentially kits at this level can be done in a hospital with surgical capacity by doctors in particular. In addition to content revisions, there are also changes to the packaging to respond to requests from the field and overcome common logistics issues. It is important to remember that a kit is not a box. 
It can in some cases be up to 60 boxes. While the number of boxes will be different per supplier for reasons which are unavoidable, UNFPA is working on a table to share that will be regularly updated with the logistics data, including for keep cool boxes. Once finalized, this will support partners in planning for logistics requirements for each kit procured. There are modifications to the boxes to increase their quality to withstand poor conditions. All boxes will be three ply, not weighing more than 25 kilos, and will be properly labeled with temperature requirements and as fragile. We have included all labeling now in English, French, Arabic, and Spanish, including the outer box and packing lists. We have now requested for cold chain boxes to be included in the numbering, which they were not in the past, and always listed as box number one to ensure that it is not forgotten in distribution, and it will include a temperature monitoring device and proper labeling. Finally, we've requested that controlled substances be packed in a separate box in the event there are unexpected issues to import at the national level. On this slide, you can see an overview of the key tools and forms related to the kits. We will quickly look at these on the next slide. One important thing to reference here is there is often confusion between the MISP calculator and the IRH kit calculator. While based on similar assumptions, the calculators have two different purposes. The MISP calculator is used to determine SRH programmatic need for affected populations based on demographics. And the RH kit calculator is used to determine supply needs for the SRH program. Within the new manual, there have been a number of changes in addition to the major clinical content changes. We've included guidance on MISP supplies not included in the kits, for example, how to ensure the availability of ARVs for continuing treatment of HIV and PMTCT, references to quality assurance, cold chain, and controlled substances management, an entire section on basic downstream logistics management for the kits, guidance on ordering of the complementary commodities, as well as three new examples of sample orders with explanations per kit. Within the manual, there is detailed guidance on the new complementary commodities. As you can see when ordering, in general, one complementary commodity kit will be ordered per each of the RH kits that it complements. For example, for each kit 2A, one chlorhexidine complementary commodity kit will be ordered. Some complementary commodities are single items to, per, uh, to procure per train provider. An example of this is the non-pneumatic anti-shock garment. And some complementary commodities are designed to complement multiple kits. One example of this is misoprostol. In this case, in the manual, you will see suggested orders per each of the kit that the complementary commodity is designed for. We have also updated, as I mentioned, all of the IEC materials. These include the addition of stock cards, new wall charts, including one for the preventing and managing newborn and maternal uterine infection, as well as one for managing preeclampsia, eclampsia, and preventing and managing postpartum hemorrhage. We've also included new operational checklists, and we've included new materials that have been developed by WHO and others since the last revision of the kit. One example of this is the WHO Family Planning Wheel for Humanitarian Settings. We've also developed a new clean delivery kit infographic, removed all full manuals, and as I said, ensured translation of nearly all of the materials into French, Spanish, and Arabic. To support partners to determine needs, a new RH kit calculator has been developed. Using basic information on the number and type of health facilities, size of the affected population, and some basic pre-crisis data, the calculator can provide a basic estimation for an order. Of course, it is not possible to mathematically say what a perfect order will be per setting. However, partners can use the order from the calculator as a basis for their decision process. To provide some context uh, to users when determining their order, they are guided to look at the total needs of supplies for the affected population, to understand what different partners are planning to or will procure aside from the kits, 
to then also look at what UNFPA will be procuring and importing on behalf of ourselves or on behalf of other partners through the SRH working group. As many of you are aware, UN organizations have different requirements for importation, which may be easier to manage than importing on your own. And then also then it is very important to identify the gap so that UNFPA and partners can advocate to fill the gap. The RH kits can be ordered from UNFPA PSB in Copenhagen by either a UNFPA country office or partners. Partners can either reach out to the SRH working group coordinator to facilitate procurement of the kits or procure directly from PSB in Copenhagen. If partners are ordering directly from PSB, external clients can use the revised request for promo invoice forms, which will be shared and submit them to UNFPA. Then a binding pro forma invoice and order confirmation is sent to the third party client. And then once processed, PSB emergency team will begin their processes to allocate and distribute the kits. I'll now pass over to Bagdagul from our emergency team. Thank you, Dani. Um, hi, uh, partners and colleagues. My name is uh, Bagdagul Abdi Karimova. I work uh, for the at the procurement services branch of UNFPA in the emergency team as a procurement associate coordinating the delivery of uh, ERH kits. Uh, today, I will uh, walk you through, um, to, uh, through two slides uh, on the process of uh, uh, order fulfillment, as well as uh, later uh, international freight. Uh, uh, fulfillment of order starts with sto uh, stock allocation. Uh, in case the stock is uh, fully available, we uh, collect the freight and uh, freight quotes and uh, share performance invoice with the customer. In case the uh, uh, stock is only partially available, uh, we inform the client accordingly and uh, whether the uh, client decides to amend or cancel the order or if the lead times are okay, uh, then uh, we uh, Again, share the pro forma invoice with, uh, for the kits and the freight. Um, once the um, pro forma invoice reviewed and the order uh, confirmation signed by the customer, uh, then uh, funding is made available uh, for the customers working on uh, advanced payment terms. Uh, 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 funds are transferred uh, for the customers working on deferred payment terms. Uh, they share with us uh, internal PO numbers, uh, confirming that the funds are made available at their end. Uh, once uh, the, we have the funding uh, available, then inventory order uh, picking plans are uh, issued uh, for the kits and purchase order is issued uh, for uh, freight. Uh, this is uh, then shared with the suppliers uh, and freight forwarders accompanied with uh, shipping instructions. Uh, after that, within two business uh, days, uh, shipping documents such as uh, invoice, uh, packing lists and certificates are shared with us. Uh, we then share it with the customer uh, to, for their review and uh, initiate preclearance uh, procedures. Uh, once the import um, uh, authorization is received by the customer, uh, we receive a green light to ship and uh, we arrange the, um, whether flights or a vessel uh, booking and the shipment takes place. Uh, after the procurement uh, cycle is uh, fully completed, uh, customer is provided with a, a final invoice and where applicable uh, refund of uh, whether unspent contingency uh, or cancelled items uh, will be transferred back uh, to the uh, customer's bank account. Uh, there are um, uh, cases when the order is uh, exceeds the stock. Uh, in such cases, the customer will be informed uh, that uh, the order will be sourced from fresh production. And if uh, agreed, then uh, we uh, place a fresh production uh, purchase order. And the rest of the cycle is similar to when the order is uh, fulfilled from uh, stock. Uh, yeah, that's it for now. Thank you. Thanks, Natalia. Yes, thank you. Um, so um, this slide um, will show um, a bit of information on uh, feedback um, on the quality of our kits or packaging, labeling, any information uh, which you would like to share. Um, and um, the feedback 
of our clients uh, is a vital part of uh, UNFPA business processes, as it helps us to ensure that the actual product quality is aligned uh, with the requirements um, established by the long-term agreements. The client's feedback is a powerful tool um, giving UNFPA crucial insights um, into the supply chain. And it also serves us as a control mechanism at the contractual uh, level. So there is no failure as long as there is a feedback. So your feedback is highly appreciated. And please share this message uh, uh, with the recipients of the kits. Um, so where can you find um, um, the feedback form? It can be downloaded uh, through uh, unfbaprocurement.org slash quality assurance. Um, and uh, you can see an example um, at the right hand side. Um, please submit um, your feedback um, to um, email address indicated on this slide. Um, and um, yeah, that would be really great and much appreciated. Thank you very much. Thanks, Natalia. And back to Bagdagul. Thank you. Um, uh, as said above, uh, we, uh, so we've been fulfilling these uh, orders uh, from two stock suppliers. And uh, since uh, they are both in Netherlands, uh, we were able to uh, arrange, uh, arrange combined shipments um, using our LTA freight forwarders. Uh, this allowed us uh, to cooperate uh, to a large extent with uh, freight forwarders uh, over the past year, especially, and uh, also to ship uh, on a, a much more cost effectively and uh, to streamline our processes uh, for all parties involved. Uh, the challenges uh, that uh, COVID-19 uh, posed to the international freight have, be, uh, have uh, affected um, quite largely uh, the uh, market of international freight. Um, so over the past year, we've been uh, working in the context of the below um, uh, challenges. Uh, for example, uh, where there, were, uh, there have been limited or restricted uh, commercial offers. We searched and uh, utilized on the opportunities created uh, by the humanitarian uh, community. Uh, thus, co we cooperated with uh, logistics uh, partners such as World Food Program or uh, EU Hub, um, both on the uh, free to user and uh, cost recovery uh, basis. Um, uh, also, the air freight uh, have been uh, high uh, compared to pre-COVID time uh, and uh, stayed uh, volatile. Thus, our suppliers and uh, freight forwarders are not able to uh, provide us with uh, uh, binding uh, codes as, as before. Um, and shipment uh, of uh, keep cool items uh, have been restricted and uh, not possible to uh, some uh, destinations. Um, uh, uh, when it is uh, 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 for the sea shipments, uh, we also uh, are working um, in the context of uh, a challenging uh, 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 circumstance to secure containers, especially for river containers. And uh, we observed this uh, particularly towards the year end. Uh, currently, uh, most ports are congested and uh, vessel uh, arrivals uh, are delayed uh, by around one month. Mm, and finally, the mm, ship, uh, couriering of uh, original shipping documents for sea shipments uh, have been uh, also uh, not possible for uh, some destinations, uh, making the process uh, much lengthier through uh, having to issue telex releases for the carriers. Um, and in such cases, and in all the, uh, all the uh, uh, challenging cases, we're working closely with both the uh, customers uh, and uh, suppliers and freight forwarders to find the uh, solutions and to be able to uh, fulfill the orders of your age kits um, and ship them in time uh, where they are needed. Thank you. Thanks, That's all. So we have included some information on these slides related to downstream logistics management. As a reminder that the process does not end for the management of the kits once they arrive to the national port of entry. Within the manual, we give guidance to users of the kits on what needs to be considered before supplies arrive, during storage and distribution, at health facilities, and monitoring for impact. 
preparing storage and distribution prior to arrival of the kits, including permissions for import and clearance are particularly important. As is the case for delivering most supplies in humanitarian settings, there are a number of challenges to maintain quality and ensure availability at the last mile. On this slide and in the guidance for users, we've included a number of these challenges which are commonly experienced. In the revision of the RH kit management guidelines for field offices, we, which will happen this year, good practice for overcoming these bottlenecks will be included. Finally, coordination in preparedness, acute response, and post-acute response among partners procuring and managing humanitarian health supplies is essential to ensure that RH kits are being delivered where they are needed and in an informed and cost-effective way. Guidance on coordination is also provided within the new manual. I will conclude by highlighting that a number of other processes within UNFPA are ongoing this year of importance to partners and of different engagement of partners in the months that will come. Uh, the UNFPA humanitarian supply strategy for the next five years has been finalized and will be shared with partners in the coming weeks. We will also be revising the RH kit management guidelines as well as finalizing the development of a preparedness document for humanitarian supplies including guidance on national prepositioning, particularly of the RH kits. We're also working to revise the dignity kit guidelines and provide a modality for partners to procure the UNFPA global LTA dignity kits without the UNFPA logo. And finally, UNFPA have plans this year to review the catalog with a perspective of humanitarian supplies. Thank you very much. I'll pass back to Katrin to facilitate the Q&A. Thank you very much, all of you presenters. You know, very clear presentation. Um, we have a few um, questions and comments already in the different chat box. I reinvite everybody, the easiest is to put it just in the general chat box and have it share it with all um, participants and panelists. Uh, in case that was not the case, case I'm, um, I'm reading them out. So I start with the first one that came from Laureen. Uh, great presentation. There was a note on a slide about ARVs not being included where the ARVs procured from? That's a great question. In the manual, we give guidance. It's, it's, it really depends on the setting, I will say. Um, there's a number of different potentials for sourcing ARVs, particularly the most obvious is if there's a vertical HIV program within the country. There are a number of reasons why UNFPA is not including ARVs, and one of them is that the national treatment protocols are quite different depending mm -hmm. on the setting, and sourcing is incredibly uh, difficult, and there's often a separate supply chain that operates even in stab stable times for these products. In the case where there's no vertical program, um, UNDP and UNICEF are procuring and importing different levels of ARVs as well. I will say we do include a small number of ARVs for adults and children within kit three, but particularly related to clinical management of rape. So when we say that ARVs are not included, we mean for the new MISP focus on continuing treatment for people already registered in an ARV treatment program prior to the conflict or disaster, and also people who are registered in a PMTCT. Um, just to say one last thing, Katrin, the supply yeah. subworking group in IWAG um, has been discussing with the HIV subworking group around if a targeted um, operational checklist or guidance is needed to support people working on the ground to be able to source ARVs for this particular context. And I encourage you to reach out to those two working groups if you would like to be engaged in that conversation. Yeah, I think that's a very good idea. People are keeping up to date and then the, it's simply that the population, the affected population, their profile regarding HIV has such a huge variety that any kind of pre-packaging and standard um, kit procurement would be a wild guess and there would be a huge amount of loss. So it's something that I think we have to weigh off the pros and cons. Um, I go to the next um, to the next intervention that comes from somebody who doesn't say who they are. How can a non-health service provider best support procurement and distribution of kits? For example, humanitarian actors such as care, plan, save the children, and so on. I think that's an interesting input. I think that there's a number of different ways that um, partners can support this. And I'm also happy for Katrin as well with your experience coming from, I would say, a, a non-UNFPA background as well to provide this um, input. But I think particularly in needs identification and gap fulfillment, so understanding who is providing what supplies 
to what facilities as a part of the coordinated SRH work around identifying where MISP services are being delivered and ensuring that MISP services are being delivered. Also ensuring that as an enabler to that, that the health facility is being supported by the international humanitarian community or as part of the humanitarian response have sufficient levels of supplies and where they don't have sufficient levels of supplies, identifying those gaps and either a, alerting them to UNFPA as part of the procurement opportunities through UNFPA, or then in another way, either procuring if you have a bilateral procurement channel. I know CARE um, has in the past procured large quantities of RH kits and pre-positioned them in Dubai for their own operations as a number of other partners have done as well. The one other thing which I will add is that there's always that support that could be delivered in terms of the downstream logistics management, mm -hmm. identifying where we can be, be better at maintaining quality assurance in the distribution. As you all are aware, quality assurance for medical supplies and distribution is different than food, right? WFP can go and drop food out of airplanes. We can't do the same thing for a vial of oxytocin. And so working with national authorities and systems and preparedness or working with UNFPA and other actors who are doing the direct provision of supplies in an acute response can be super um, constructive. The IWAG has developed together with RHSC um, some really good uh, checklists and materials for different audiences, donors, humanitarian actors, development actors, et cetera, in terms of uh, supporting an SRH supply chain and humanitarian operation. Thank you, Dani. I think you covered that very comprehensively. Um, maybe one final comment, and you already alluded to it, the, the on the ground coordination helps a lot when it comes to what you refer to as the downstream logistics. I mean, sometimes you see trucks and trucks coming in with different logos on them, and that pooling would be desirable, but we all know that that's not always as easy as it looks, but the effort should be made, of course, in, you know, to, to try to use, um, to, to either pull the transport when there's security involved and when we're better off with a, with a convoy or to share certain transport means when it's small quantities. So it's something. The other that, thing, that, I'll, the other thing, sorry, just to add quickly that um, if other partners are procuring RH kits bilaterally from procurement services branch, it's really important that the UNFPA country office is aware of that. If you mm -hmm. remember the slide where I said, you know, talking about total need and then identifying who's bringing in what to ensure that we're not over procuring or missing certain partners, et cetera, ensuring that communication, even if you're going to bilaterally procure your own product, either from UNFPA or from another source is very uh, important. Thank you. And then we have another intervention um, from David Mulba from Liberia. It says, considering the lead time for sea shipment of kits, is it possible to decentralize the storage of kit from Copenhagen warehouse? I think you're gonna love that one as a as an entry <laughs> to talk about plans going forward, Danielle. Yeah, sure, I'll start and then I'll see if Daniela, the other Daniela from PSB wants to add anything. But um, I will say that we are working as UNFPA to decentralize our stock. Um, we have plans now with supplies going through PSI already to hold stock with UNHRD in Dubai. Um, the C shipment lead times are yes, challenging. However, in cases where it's an acute emergency, we do often do air shipments and particularly places where it was an unpredicted emergency. In terms of places where there's sea shipment, while pre-positioning will likely reduce the lead time when sea shipment is used, what's really important is looking at your supply chain and building a supply plan, which takes into consideration the lead time of the sea shipment from where the products are sourced to where they're delivered and then reordering accordingly. And you know, we know that humanitarian funding is quite challenging and short term often, um, but even if there's some work done to, to prepare beforehand, you can really work to improve the, the supply chain while taking into consideration the lead times for the sea shipments. Danielle, do you wanna add anything about our, our pre-positioning? No, not really. I, ha I think you have covered it. Um pretty good um, and just to comment that the kits are actually not stored in Copenhagen they are stored with the, our suppliers who are currently located in the Netherlands and um, in principle we have quite good uh, shipment options uh, from the Netherlands by sea so um, yeah we're we're also very much uh, uh, working uh, with the freight forwarders when, uh, when identifying uh, modes of shipment so it's just the reality of the 2020 that uh, uh, even sea shipments have uh, become challenging uh, already. Thank you. 
Um, so I read the intervention from Alex from Ka, from Plan. Thanks so much for the question and answer. Very relevant for me. Um, I work for Plan and I'm currently looking at how we can best support the health service providers to provide, for example, contraceptive services for adolescents or young people. If I understand you correctly, the best way for us to do this would be first support needs and identification and alert UNFPA and others through the coordination system. And second, where we have capacity procuring and positioning kits with health service providers we partner with. That's a question. I think there's a lot of, um, <laughs> there's a lot in there. Danny, do you want to, do you want to start on it? I think, Katrin, why don't you start maybe? I, I think it would be most apt. I mean, there's, this is not only procurement. As you say, Alex, there's, a, there's quite a lot involved in everything that has to do the mapping, the exact needs, what kind of strategy, what kind of level of intervention, understanding of what the national protocols look like, national laws look like. So there's the whole part of what is actually feasible and desirable in the context that you work with. And that you would really feed with into the sexual reproductive health working group. So it's, you know, normally it's a, it's a spin off of the, of the health cluster, which organizes around sexual reproductive health. When it comes to, um, to procurement, and I let Danny, um, I, I let Danny compliment that, I think it's a little bit more delicate um, because the, the whole procurement cut and who needs what at what time is a little bit fickle. So if you just if you do need identification and you want to channel products, the question if, if you doing that would be um, the most, let's say the most um, cost-effective way, unless you really do that channeling for a local partner, working on localization and helping them to get off the ground. But I think if you work with another international partner, there's probably a more cost-efficient way to go about it rather than going through. So for example, directly going through UNFPA. Danny, do you want to compliment that? Yeah, I'll add two things. One of them is it's not always about like, we're, you know, we're not always talking about an entire country that has devolved into conflict, right? Mm. Where you have a situation of a context like Nigeria, which is a really good example where you have a part of the country, which is, you know, fragile, a part of the country, which is not. And so also it's important to consider what's available nationally already. And if the government can redirect supplies, of course, that becomes more complicated if the government is a party to a conflict. Uh, clearly. The second thing which I'll say is that what we would really encourage just from a logistics perspective and for ease and financial ease of everyone is even if you are an actor at the local level and you'd like to procure RH kits for your own program implementation or to target an area that UNFPA is not targeting or that another partner is not targeting, pooling the procurement order with orders that are going to already be placed by UNFPA who are ordering huge quantities of these kits will not only ensure that you have to pay only one sea shipment or air shipment, but that also, you know, UNFPA as a UN agency has preferential customs clearance and taxation uh, situation in terms of our procurement opportunities. And we also have relationships with the government which make these processes easier often. So again, it's important to take into these considerations when you're gonna either procure on your own or, or you'll procure with UNFPA, thanks. Thank you, Dani. So we have another question. I was a bit late to the meeting, so maybe I have missed something, but the main question is, would it be possible to receive monthly stock reports of available stocks, allocated stocks and pipeline orders, for example? Thank you. I think we had that in another webinar and uh, I don't remember who, I think it was Dan Daniela who answered that question. Am I right? Yeah, but maybe it's okay. I'll start because for external yeah. partners, okay. it's also a bit different. Um, I think that one th the, the way to go at the country level would be to try and use the coordination structures in the local context, whether it's an SRH working group, health cluster, health sector, et cetera, to basically ask the country office what's on order, what is available, um, what's been distributed, et cetera, as part of the regular coordination activities. One example, if Nadine was here, uh, many of you know Nadine, if she was here, she would mention in Gaziantep, for example, for Syria cross-border, regularly the different health actors met together to say, okay, who's planning to bring what across the border into the country and which health facilities are you targeting? In the supply provision. I think mm. from a global perspective to, new, to know stock on hand and to know these things, it is a bit difficult. If there is a real reason that would impact 
the programmatic improvement for other actors to have this information from UNFPA, then we can work on it. If it's just around visibility and things like this, I think that's a more systematic conversation which needs to be had um, maybe within the context of an RHSC or with our development side of the organization around including the humanitarian supply provision within things like the global FP van or whatever kinds of other spin-off mechanisms around supply chain visibility uh, move forward. But uh, Daniela, I don't know if you want to add anything to this, but. No, really, I think you have um, clarified all, all the points. Um, if this information is available at our end. If need be, we, we can uh, potentially share it. Uh, but um, yeah, I think uh, we just need to understand what is the purpose of this information, how do we plan to use it, and, and is it really this information that we actually need in order to, to implement your activities. All right, so I'm still going to leave the, the floor open to anybody who wants to raise a hand and have another comment, intervention, observation, or question. At the moment, we have nothing else written in our little boxes. Oh, yes, no. So is there any other question, comment, observation that um, somebody would like to make? Maybe I can add one thing while we're waiting yeah. for colleagues to type if they would like. Um, at the bottom of the slide, you can see there's a number of different uh, groups and coordination mechanisms that are underway to both ensure that supplies are meeting the needs of the different programs of partners and to also ensure that we are operating in collaboration with the other health sectors. Of course, there's the IWAG Supply Sub Working Group with which Sarah and I both co-coordinate. And if you would like to participate in this, we're always looking for more people to contribute and participate, um, including to review documents that we're coming up with, et cetera, or participating with the partnership with Reproductive Health Supply Coalition. Um, but we also have the Humanitarian Health Supplies Group where which WHO and UNFPA co-coordinate within the wider health sector. And then also the MHM and emergencies working group um, are all areas that you could uh, interact with. And of course, okay. you can always reach out to UNFPA directly. Thank you, Danielle. And we have no further questions. So I'm going to take the opportunity uh, to give the floor to Sarah, um, Sarah Rich, to um, make some wrap up remarks. You're still invited to put in your questions if you want to, but if not, we'll wrap up with Sarah and thank everybody afterwards. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Katrine. Thanks, Danny. Um, so I, I think I don't know everyone who's listed in the participants. Um, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Sarah Rich. I'm the Associate Director for Sexual and Reproductive Health at the Women's Refugee Commission. And I also co-lead the, the Supplies Subworking Group of the IWAG, as Danny mentioned. Um, so I just wanted to say thanks very much to UNFPA for um, conducting this really informative webinar today. Um, the IWAG is very pleased to have co-hosted it with you and we're excited to see the launch of the revised kits. Um, we're particularly excited to see uh, many of the solutions and processes that have been um, carefully constructed and that will be implemented to address some of the challenges that partners on the ground faced um, in, the, in the fifth iteration of the kit. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a really exciting development. Um, I, I also wanted to say that, um, you know, we know the, that the successful rollout of the kits in humanitarian settings depends both on UNFPA and on implementing partners. Um, and we do hope that the IWAG provides some space for that two-way feedback, that two-way discussion and dialogue between UNFPA and implementing partners who are working on the ground. Um, this is one of the objectives of the Supply Subworking Group, and um, we're very fortunate that Danny and others at UNFPA are, are very much interested in um, fostering and responding to that two-way dialogue. Um, the Supply Subworking Group also works in areas um, around uh, preparedness to make sure that supplies are available when an acute emergency comes. Uh, and we also work on making sure that in post acute emergency settings, there's a transition from uh, the emergency supply chain to a more stable and informed supply chain. Um, participants who are whose organizations or who are individually associate level members of the IWAG are welcome to join the supply subworking group. Um, and if you're interested in doing so, we, we very much encourage it. You can see that Danny has left her, her email address on this slide. Please go ahead and reach out to her. Or if you have my contact information, you can also reach out to me. Um, but 
Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much to all of you for participating and for your good questions. I see that there are a few more questions. Um, so I will turn it back over to our hosts to answer those questions. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I have another question that comes back and, I, and I'll give uh, Dani also the opportunity to give you some more information about the new kits. So um, Alex brings up the question of how supplies for quality health services for survivors are guaranteed and things maybe the collaboration across the board with the GBV cluster is something that requires some more and longer discussion. I think part of that, you're, you're right, it's a, it's a long discussion, but I think we can come in with two important clarifications. A, everything that is clinical management of rape and IPV is part of SRH kits. So you have that entire supply, including as, as um, Danny had said, everything around PEP, um, emergency contraception and so on is part of the kits and you'll see it in the list. So that, that one's covered. Mm -hmm. And then I'll let maybe Danny say, say a word on, on the other side of what UNFPA has been working on regarding dignity kits, even though that's, it's not exactly this subject, but might be interesting to, to flag it. Yeah, I'll also just add quickly that UNFPA does have at the, our, in our roving team a CMR specialist who travels around yeah. focused specifically on SRH and GBV integration. There are also a lot of conversations within UNFPA around SRH and GBV integration wider than just CMR. Mm -hmm. um, one of those places, for example, is also MHM. Um, and as many of you are aware, we are working now to revise our Dignity Kit guidelines. We're, we're going to be really looking at providing supportive um, guidance and a more of a flexibility around um, the different kinds of kits that be, can be procured related to GBV and SRH, particularly for things like distribution of supplies as a protection mechanism, mechanism in uh, postpartum uh, or for adolescents. These kinds of areas where it's more of a, you know, maybe in a woman-friendly safe space, they're distributing adolescent kits and also doing, you know, comprehensive sexuality education or different components um, like this as well. I'll just take the opportunity, Katrin, to remind one thing which we did not mention. Um, in the email that was sent by the IWAG, you'll see that as of uh, the new kits will only be available from 31st March as procurement. And I would like to highlight that there will be a period of overlap where both the fifth edition kits and the sixth edition kits are out. We need to deplete the stock of the fifth edition kits. But when you make orders, our procurement branch will be very clear around which content you will be receiving from the kits and make sure that everyone is in agreement and comfortable with the situation. You're muted. Oops, sorry about that. Thank you very much. Um, we have no further interventions from the floor, so maybe um, I think we can, you know, profit to, to wrap up timely. I reiterate, as Danielle said, this has been recorded. The recording is available, as is the presentation. Is that correct, Dani? Presentation is available if you want to share it with with colleagues for further insight into how this whole process is going and what is upcoming in terms of new kits and the materials and complementary information. You have all the context. If you have specific questions, please don't hesitate to reach out either to Dani or to the, um, or to the supply subworking group of IWAC members. And we thank you for your participation today and look forward to the rollout of the sixth edition of the kit this year going forward. Take care, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. All good? All good. Forgot Eric's title and Shoko's last name. <laughs>